The last time we saw that the Apostle Paul spoke to the Thessalonians as a nursing mother cares for her children. And today we're going to see that Paul then uses the illustration of a spiritual father who trains his children in the Christian life. And so we're going to look at his instruction to them and see how it applies to us in our Christian walk today. Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we look today at the instructions that your apostle Paul gave to the Thessalonian Christians, and we see what he says to us regarding a godly Christian walk, we pray that you would apply the same truths to our lives in our day, that we might live lives that are worthy of our calling in Christ our Savior. Please forgive our sins, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of God. I'm reading today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, down through verse 12. For you remember, brethren our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom, and glory. Amen. This is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he add his wonderful blessings to our reading and hearing and understanding of it this day. In the passage before us today, we are going to notice three things. Paul's work, Paul's walk, and Paul's talk. We'll begin with his work. Now, you'll recall, as we've seen, that Paul was being accused by enemies of the gospel of being a traveling con man. And in Paul's day, there were many such traveling con men. They would come into a town, they would promise great things, they would gather a crowd, and they would solicit money from them in order to obtain favor with the gods uh, because these con men said they had some special connection to a god or, or gods, and uh, therefore they would bilk folks out of their money. And before anyone realized what had happened, they skipped town with money or goods. And so the enemies of Jesus Christ, the enemies of the Apostle Paul, have accused Paul and his companions of being traveling con men. And Paul is making an effort to show that that is not the case, that he is distancing himself entirely from such accusations. Uh, Paul sets about intentionally to show that this missionary activity that he was engaged in was not of the same type as these traveling con men. So instead of demanding, as he could have as an apostle of Jesus Christ, instead of demanding from the Thessalonians that they take care of him and that they provide for him, and he could have done this because of his standing with the Lord, instead of doing that, the apostle Paul talks about how uh, they labored and toiled night and day. Now, those words are all important. The word for labor that Paul uses here comes from a word that means to strike something. And it uh, began to denote the, uh, the effect of having stricken something, uh, that it produced an effect in, in an object. And so uh, you'd have someone beating out copper, and by the time they finished, you see the effect of having used a hammer on a sheet of, of copper or any other type of material. And so this, uh, this word denotes work that produces weariness and uh, sweat. And then the next word is toil, and it's a word that uh, comes to describe uh, labor that's done through difficulty. And so it's talking about overcoming of many difficulties. Now the point is, Paul uses these two terms, labor and toil, 
to indicate to us that what he and Silas and Timothy were engaged in was not some token effort to appear busy in the eyes of men, but rather uh, they were working hard at this manual labor in order to provide for themselves. They, they worked, they sweated, they had difficulty in the jobs that were at hand. Now we know from the book of Acts that the apostle Paul was by trade a tent maker. In Israel in Paul's day, there were uh, no uh, schools with professional teachers of any kind. Rather, uh, each rabbi uh, and each uh, father would take on a uh, young man in order to train him in some type of discipline. And so uh, Paul had learned the discipline of being a tent maker. That meant he worked in leather and he worked in canvas that had been made out of goat's hair. And so this was hard, very difficult manual labor, but Paul was skilled in this. He had been trained in this. Now, the purpose of all of this is so that these missionaries might not be a burden to the Thessalonians who are coming to Jesus Christ. Uh, while Paul was at Thessalonica, uh, there were some uh, brothers and sisters in the town of Philippi that he had left who did send him some financial aid. They helped him. We find, in fact, that the uh, Philippian church was known for its support of Paul and his missionary activity. And so there were other churches that were established that were sending money to help these missionaries during their labor. In fact, it's the same principle that we have today. When a church in this country sends missionaries to a foreign field, we do not expect the people in that foreign field to pay the missionaries to preach the gospel to them. Instead, churches at home provide financial support for the missionaries so that they not, might not be a burden on the ones that they are teaching about Jesus Christ. Now, eventually, of course, those churches will be established, and eventually those churches will begin to take on their own financial responsibilities. But, just like it is here in Thessalonica, Paul did not want to be accused of being in this for the money, and he did not want to be a burden to the Thessalonian Christians. And so he uh, says, we worked hard, even though we could have foregone that work and asked you for money, because I am, after all, an apostle. We worked hard in order to not be a burden to you as we preach the gospel of God to you. And so we see the example there of Paul's hard work. It's an example for every Christian about hard work that we ought to do. And it's an example for the church of how we ought to support those who uh, indeed preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells these Thessalonians that they labored strenuously night and day. There were parts of the day, parts of the night where they had to work very hard uh, with manual labor. But this was for the purpose of we preach the gospel of God to you. And so they sustained themselves by this manual labor in order to be able to uh, keep going there in Thessalonica and preach the gospel to the Thessalonians that they might become believers in Jesus Christ. Now notice what he calls the message that he proclaimed. He calls it the gospel of God. Now, what do we mean by that? What we mean, gospel means good news. And so this is the good news of the salvation that God himself provides for us through his son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's the message that God has chosen a people uh, from before the foundation of the world that in time and in history, he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, who came and who lived a life of righteousness and holiness on behalf of the people that he represented. Then he took our sins and went to the cross and he bled and he died in our place and the, received the wrath of God poured out upon himself on the cross so that we might be set free from our sin, our guilt, and from the wrath of Almighty God. And so Christ has done these two things. He has provided for us a righteousness that we lack, and His righteousness is perfect. And He has provided for us redemption from our sins and our guilt, and has delivered us from the wrath of God in this life and the wrath to come. And so He has done all of those things. And so the gospel message is called the gospel of God because it is all about what God has done for men 
The gospel is not about you, and it's not about me, and it's not about Paul. The gospel is about Jesus Christ and what God has done for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's called the gospel of God here. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy and others worked hard physically in order to set an example to these Thessalonians of how Christians are to labor. And at the same time, they also spoke to them the truths of the gospel message so that uh, they would learn what they needed to know about their own sin in the eyes of a holy God, about the redemption provided for them by the Lord Jesus Christ, and about the necessity of repenting from their sins and trusting in Christ by faith. And so all of this message, this message of salvation, is a wonderful message of what God has done for us in Christ. Now, notice that the message is not work hard as we do. That's not what the message of the gospel is. That message that Paul is talking about here is for believers. It's what we do after we have become saved. And so the message that Paul would deliver to the unregenerate, the message that Paul presented to those who were apart from Christ was, you are a sinner in the eyes of God. Repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ in his life and death and his resurrection, and you will be saved. And so uh, it's all about what Christ has done. It's, it's all about receiving the benefits of what Christ has done by God's grace through faith alone. But once you have been converted, once you have become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we need to understand that we are never to leave the impression uh, that either salvation comes by our hard work or that once we are Christians, we don't have to do anything at all. Both of those are extremes and they're both wrong. Salvation comes by the hard work of the Lord Jesus Christ and those of us who have been redeemed freely by His grace are then set to work to glorify God. And so our work comes after our salvation. Our work comes after our redemption. Our work comes as a result of our having put faith in Jesus, not in order to earn any of those things, because we can't. And so as a Christian, what we are called upon to do is work hard as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, just as Paul worked hard, labored hard, to set an example for the Thessalonians. And so everything has been changed. We have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus. We are new creatures in Christ, and now we are set upon the path of righteousness, and we are to walk in it with diligence and hard work and hard effort to uh, progress in the Christian life, to walk as uh, we are... A call to walk, to walk in a manner worthy of our great calling in Jesus. And that's what Paul is talking about here. It applied to them back then, and it applies to you and to me today as well. Having talked about his work among them, the Apostle Paul now turns to talk about his walk among these Thessalonian Christians. And so uh, he's looking at his behavior in a particular way. He says, you are witnesses and God also, how devoutly. And what he's getting at here is uh, the fact that these Thessalonians can testify to the truth of what he's about to tell them. He's not going to lie to them. He knows that they themselves know these very facts. And he's calling God as his witness as well. This is a very solemn a thing that he is saying, both these Thessalonian Christians and God can testify to the truth of what Paul is saying. And so he begins to talk about his behavior among them. And he gives us three words that focus this behavior in three different areas. First of all, he talks about his behavior toward God. And then he talks about his behavior toward these fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ in Thessalonica. And then he talks about his behavior as it is witnessed by those outside of the church of the Lord Jesus. And so the first word that he uses is how devoutly. And this is a term that's focused on his relationship with God. It's part of that threefold orientation of his behavior. He's talking about being devout or being holy. Uh, that root word of that basically means to be set apart. And so what Paul is saying here is that he lived his life as one who is set apart to God 
and to God alone. His thoughts, his words, his deeds all took into account his relationship to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was a relationship uh, in which he sought with all of the grace that God was given, giving to him to live a life that was set apart from unbelief, that was set apart from the world, that was set apart from sin in order to seek to live in such a way that God was pleased. And so the uppermost thought in uh, Paul's mind as he went about doing this, about living a life that was devout or a life that was holy before God was... Uh, am I able to please my God through Jesus through the things that I am saying and through the things that I am thinking and through the things that I am doing? And so uppermost was his relationship to God and seeking to be holy in the eyes of God and be approved by God through Christ. The second thing that he says is, and justly. And so here that his behavior is focused toward other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that these new Christians understood how Paul was living among them. His behavior was just. It was righteous. That's the other term that sometimes is used to translate this word. Now, we're not saying here, and Paul is not claiming, I've never sinned. He's not saying that at all. He is not saying that he has never sinned whatsoever. What he is saying is that there were no obvious sin patterns in his life that uh, a Christian might look at and see and be led astray by. In other words, Paul was not saying one thing and then hypocritically doing something else. And as uh, these new converts looked at Paul, they said, well, he says this, but he lives this way. I guess it's okay for us to live that way too. He's saying, no, that's not the case. I'm living a life that matches what I say. I'm living a life. I'm trying to, to live uh, in the eyes of God as a holy person, and I'm trying to live before you as one who is just or righteous in the sight of God, but also in your sight as well. And so he's not seeking to lead anyone astray from the gospel by his life. And we would do well to learn that very thing also in the church today, that when we preach the gospel, that our lives ought to match what we preach. We cannot ever say one thing and do something else. We are to live lives uh, because we desire to, uh, to live a life of holiness before God. We ought to seek to live a life of righteousness before men so that they see that our words and our deeds match, that the gospel is true, that Jesus has had an impact in our hearts and in our lives and that our lives have been changed, and so we walk in a particular new way, a way of righteousness, a way that is just in the eyes of men and in the eyes of God. And then the third thing he says uh, has to do with his blameless behavior. And blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believed. And so devoutly and justly and then blamelessly. And here he's talking about uh, focusing upon those who are outside of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the watching world, the people who observed him as a believer going about what he was doing and saying the things he was saying. They, they observed him from afar. They saw uh, what he was doing. Now, he's not calling upon them uh, to bear witnesses to uh, how he was righteous or how he was holy because the world can't do that. But the world can observe what he's doing. And so Paul is not saying here either when he says he's blameless and seeking to live blamelessly, he's not saying he's uh, sinless in any way. What he is saying is that when these unbelievers looked at him, they would not see anything in his behavior that would cause them to blaspheme God or to uh, sin against God by following his example. Uh, there would not be anything that they could speak against Christ because of Paul's behavior uh, toward them. And so uh, the idea was there are not any actual sins that are evident that these people could pick up and they could use to attack the Apostle Paul. Uh, so instead what they do, we see uh, in this passage, is they lie about him. They, there's not something that they can grab hold of. Uh, Paul is not living in adultery. Paul is not lying to people. Paul is not stealing money from anyone. Uh, 
Uh, Paul is living a holy life before God and a righteous life before men. And so because there is nothing that they can do, they have to make up lies against him. The world observed Paul just as the world observes us. Uh, and they could not charge him with any legitimate sins against the Thessalonians. And therefore, uh, they were forced to make up these lies in order to try to discredit him. But Paul says, you Thessalonians, you know the truth about how I live. Now, that ought to be the case for us as well. It ought to be the case for us today in the church that, that if the world looks at us, they could not point the finger and say, uh, he says that he is holy and he says that he is righteous, but look at him stealing from these poor people or look at him taking advantage of this person or that person or uh, living in adultery or committing some type of crime. Uh, this should never be the case for Christians and especially not for those of us who are pastors and ministers of the gospel. Our lives ought to be holy before God and righteous before men and blameless before the world so that if they say anything against us, it has to be a lie. There should be no truth in it whatsoever. Having mentioned his work among them and having uh, set the example of uh, his walk among them, Paul now turns to remind the Thessalonians of his talk with them. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged each and every one of you. And so he uses three terms here to describe his talk among and to the Thessalonian Christians. He wants to remind them of his manner of speaking with them. And so what he's going to do in, in this section, he's going to liken his uh, speaking with them to a father who trains his children. Uh, remember the, the, the family references that we see in this section. He's already mentioned a nursing mother and her gentleness toward her baby. And now he speaks of a father, a spiritual father, a godly father who is training his children in righteousness. And so that's what we see in this section here. He is gentle like that nursing mother, and he is instructive and supportive and patient like a godly father who is training his children in righteousness. And so the first term he uses is that he exhorted them. Now, that word, exhorted, is the verb that is related to the noun that describes the Holy Spirit and Jesus as well. Uh, it is a term that, uh, that has to do with the Holy Spirit who is our comforter, who is our counselor. And so this word could be translated as comforted or counseled. But what it literally means is to come alongside of someone and support that individual in his time of need. And so this exhortation that Paul gave was a, an exhortation to support these new believers in their Christian walk. It's done through confronting someone with the claims of the gospel uh, and making demands uh, of that person on behalf of what God says in Holy Scripture uh, and uh, what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ would expect of us as believers as he sets forth in Scripture so that the individual's life is changed and he begins to walk in a godly manner. And so exhortation has to do with providing information. It has to do with providing instruction, but it has to do with also uh, basically uh, placing the demands of God upon a person's heart and saying, now walk in this way. This is what God desires. He says this in scripture. And uh, it has to do with speaking the truth of God and comforting or encouraging these Thessalonians to walk in a manner that's worthy of their calling in Jesus Christ. That's what he's getting at here. And so wrapped up in this concept of exhortation is comfort, it is counsel, it is encouragement, it is demand, uh, it is imperative. You are to walk in this way. Uh, you will be able to walk in this way as God gives you grace. And so Paul says, just like a father does this, that this is what he did among them. He exhorted them in the truths uh, 
of the gospel of Jesus in the truths of what it means to live a godly Christian life in a fallen world. Next, what Paul says is along with exhortation, what he also did was he provided comfort. He says, and he comforted them. Now, these words are often translated uh, much the same way. And so uh, in, in a dictionary, you'll see that the word exhortation, uh, the Greek word for exhortation, the Greek word for comfort here, are often translated by the same types of things. It's talking about comfort. It's talking about uh, uh, consolation. But this word comfort seems to have along with it the idea that a person is discouraged and overcome and bewildered and therefore you are coming alongside that individual uh, to meet the need that that person has at that particular moment. That person needs to be encouraged in his Christian walk because he's become discouraged for some reason. So Paul says, along with exhorting, do this, he also came alongside of these folks and he gave them comfort and encouragement and consolation, uh, encouraging them to continue their walk even though it was hard, even though it was difficult. We've got to do the same thing today as Christians. What we need to do is what Paul was doing. We need to remind one another of the marvelous promises of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is using as the information that he's providing. He's exhorting these Thessalonian Christians, these new converts, to keep on walking in the truth, even though it is difficult, even though there is opposition. And he is reminding them of the marvelous promises of God that are ours in Jesus Christ. And that is great consolation when you face great difficulty. The third type of speaking that the Apostle Paul said he did toward the Thessalonians was to charge them and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. And so the idea here is to uh, entreat them, to charge them. The, what Paul is doing here is he's coming alongside these Thessalonian new converts to Christ, and he is seeking to motivate them to continue growing, even though they are growing weary in their Christian walk, to keep on going in the Christian life even though it's tough, even though it's hard, even though it is very difficult and there's opposition from our own sinful hearts as well as from the world outside us. And so Paul is, is charging them by seeking to show them that their labors in the Lord are not in vain, that eventually they will reap if they do not give up. But uh, even if we don't see results immediately, or even if we never see results in our lifetime, our labor in the Lord is never in vain. And so he's encouraging them in this way. And he says the manner of this charging them is as a father does his own children. Now, he's setting the pattern, once again, a nursing mother being gentle, and now as a father charging his own children. Uh, he wants them to follow the pattern that he is setting for them, and he's giving this uh, example of the pattern of a father uh, instructing his children. Uh, this is not a father who is berating his children. This is not a father who is uh, vilifying his children uh, because they don't do immediately what he says to do. This is rather a father who is patiently instructing his children. So I thought about this. Uh, I, I thought that maybe an illustration of this for us today would be a father teaching a child to ride a bicycle. If you've done that, you know what it's like. Uh, you help the child up on the bicycle once the training wheels are off. And uh, while he's uh, seated on the seat, you encourage him to be able to go. You talk to him about balance and you walk along beside him holding onto the seat and, and uh, he begins to get his balance and he starts to pedal. And there comes a point where in your encouragement, you let go and you say, pedal. And then he falls over and you go and you pick him up and you start all over again, but you do it with patience. You don't berate him uh, because he fell over the first time. You know that it takes a while to learn such a skill. And so as a godly father, you encourage this child and you are patient with him and you help him over and over again because you know that eventually he's going to learn to pedal. Eventually he's going to learn to stay upright. And so Paul is running alongside these Thessalonians, holding on to the bicycle seat, and he is encouraging them, walk worthy of your calling in Christ. 
and he lets go of the seat and he encourages them to pedal harder, to walk in a godly manner. He lets go and he encourages them to go on. That's what we're to do. And so uh, as we instruct uh, new converts in Christ, we show them how to walk. We help them learn to balance as a Christian. But there comes a point where we have to let go of the seat and they have to paddle, uh, uh, to pedal. And so we let them go uh, to pedal uh, hard and we encourage them to keep on going, even when they fall over, to get back on that bike and to ride some more. And so as Christians, this is... Uh, the type of thing that we ought to do today. This is what Paul is doing. He's providing encouragement. He is, he is charging these Thessalonians, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And so now we're going to look at the charge itself. The charge itself is this, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And so the charge is an exhortation for them to walk worthily of their God in their Christian life. Now, no true Christian can remain as he was at the moment of his conversion. We all come to God through Christ as wretched sinners. We come in rebellion against God. We are brought to repentance and faith, but we are not allowed by God to remain in that wretched state of rebellion and sin against God. Yes, we're saved apart from our own good works. We're saved by the, the wonderful, perfect work of the Lord Jesus. But we're saved unto good works, as Paul says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which God prepared in advance for us to walk in them or to do them. And so uh, we're saved unto good works. We're not saved by good works. And so we are all uh, to exhibit changed lives. And that's what Paul is talking about here. It's an exhortation to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that they've received in Jesus Christ. There must be a change in you as you grow in your Christian faith and in your Christian life. Paul is not saying at all that by your works you're worthy of being saved. He's not, that's not what he's getting at here. He is saying that a believer who is saved by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is to give evidence in his life of that change, of true salvation, of regeneration, of repentance. And therefore, that new life is patterned after Jesus, your Savior. We are being conformed more and more into the image of Jesus Christ who has redeemed us. And notice also that it is God who has called you, Christian, to this new life. He effectively calls you with the gospel of salvation and you have come through repentance and faith, uh, which are gifts of God, to uh, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has called you to live a life of holiness as a result of your conversion. And so this life is uh, made fit by the Holy Spirit for God's kingdom and for God's glory. Now, we know that it is impossible for anyone who remains unconverted, who remains in his sin, to ever be fit for the kingdom of God. And it's, the same thing is true. It's, it's impossible for anyone who is unconverted to be fit for the glory of God. And so our effectual call that is given to us by the Holy Spirit from God is, uh, produces this effect in us. It produces the effect of repentance from sin and faith in Jesus. It produces the effect of sanctification, our growth in grace day by day as we grow in holiness. It, uh, it results ultimately in a final conformity to the image of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this fitness for the eternal life of the kingdom of God and for the glory of God is what the Holy Spirit is working in us. And it comes from this call that God has placed upon our lives. And we are to walk in a manner that is in keeping with that call, a manner that is worthy of that call. Uh, we're not called to continue to live in sin. We're not called to live in rebellion against God. We're not called to live just however we want. We are called to live lives of obedient faith through our Savior Jesus Christ. Lives that reflect the glory of Christ in us. And so we are to do such things by God's power, by God's Spirit, and in keeping with God's call upon us. So how about you? If you're watching or listening today, how about you? Have you 
heard that call of God through Jesus Christ today? Have you turned from your sins uh, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only Savior? Have you put your faith in Him? Are you in the process of growing in holiness day after day? Are you dying unto sin and living unto righteousness? Are you being conformed more and more into the image of Jesus, your Savior? Uh, are you being made fit by the work of the Holy Spirit uh, to be ready for the eternal kingdom of God and for the eternal glory of God? Uh, if not, then I urge you to listen to what is said. Turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today. And you will find that these things that I have mentioned to you will begin at this very moment to take place in your life. You will uh, be worked upon by God's Holy Spirit and you will uh, be in the process of being sanctified and growing in holiness. And these things will begin to develop in your own life. But you must turn from sin and trust in Christ because there's no hope apart from Him. If you haven't done so already, do so now. Amen. Let us pray once again. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how I thank you uh, for this wonderful calling that you've placed upon our lives as believers in Jesus Christ, that we indeed are called to uh, walk in a manner that is worthy of you, uh, that is uh, a manner that prepares us for your eternal kingdom, and your eternal glory through Jesus. And so, Father, my prayer is anyone listening today who is apart from Christ, who is of your elect, please send your spirit to make effective the words of uh, the message that Paul preaches here to us, uh, to drive it home to that person's heart and grant to that one repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Give a new heart, a heart of flesh that believes in the gospel. And so I pray, Lord, that you would glorify your holy name. Please forgive our sins and bless those of us who are Christians to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that you have given to us through Christ. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week, and I look forward to bringing the word of God again next time.